A stack is a data structure that deals with data in a last-in, first-out manner. This just means when you try to retrieve an element from the stack, it will give you the element that was most recently given to it. But what is the stack used for, and why is it so important? The most common real-world comparison of a stack is just a stack of papers on a desk. When you add paper to the stack, it gets placed on top of all the other papers. And if you want to pick up a piece of paper, you can only grab the one that's on top. These are the two basic operations of a stack. Push, adding to the stack, and pop or pull, removing from the stack. And that's about it. The concept of a stack is very simple, but just how much it helps with data and execution management far exceeds its simplicity. This is what makes the stack so great. If this was all you knew, you might be a little confused. If the system you're using allows you to store data anywhere in memory, wherever you'd like, why would you ever use the stack? The ability to access data in the stack seems pretty limited, and it just seems like a nuisance. Well, the stack wasn't meant to be used for most data management, but what it was built for, it does really well. So even though we said before that you can only access the value on top of the stack, that just refers to the push and pop operations. Pop will remove the topmost element from the stack, and push places a new element above the current topmost element. All of the elements can be read or written to at any time, but the size of the stack will not change unless a push or pop operation occurs. Now let's move on to the biggest use of the stack, stack frames. Most assembly instruction sets have some sort of routine call and return operations. This allows a chunk of code, a function, routine, subroutine, to be run multiple times from multiple places. This way the code doesn't have to be duplicated over and over every time you need to use it. Now, the call instruction encodes information about where the subroutine is located in memory. In this example, address AC19. But how does the return instruction know where to return to? It can't encode this information itself, since the subroutine can be called from multiple places in the code. The answer is that the call operation will push the location of the next instruction to the stack, so that the return instruction can then pop it back off and jump to that location. So in this example, the address ADBA is pushed to the stack, which is the location of the instruction directly after the call instruction. The bytes that hold the return addresses are the backbones of the stack frames. Each stack frame will contain its return address and other data elements that got pushed to the stack during that frame's execution. When a subroutine is called, the current frame is suspended and a new frame is created on top of it. Nesting many subroutines within one another will result in more stack frames and therefore a taller stack. One example where stack frames help structure things better is parameter passing. A parameter, or argument, is just a value that a subroutine needs in order to function properly. If the subroutine parameters are pushed to the stack before the routine is called, it can then expect to find these parameters in the frame directly underneath the current frame. In this example, the parameters 31 and 02 are in the stack underneath the routine's return address. Remember, the stack is all located in memory, so any element can be accessed at any time. I hope all of you enjoyed a different presenter to teach us a little bit about stacks. And this goes back to our presentation from yesterday on the storage of different variables and different elements within a computer's memory. As seen in our wonderful video from Retro Game Mechanics, the stack is where we store all of a function's variables and where when you add a new function, the new function's details get stored. The principal element of these that we need to add to the stack frame, as mentioned in the video, is the return address. So when you finish running a function, you need to know where to go back, where the function was called from. And the address of where it was called from is put on the stack and then removed when you hit the return and the computer processes that and therefore knows where to go back in the program. The stack grows, in this case, remember, it go goes from high addresses down to low addresses. So when we talk about adding things to the stack, you can imagine that we've oriented our pile of papers upside down, but that there's no gravity. So we can just keep adding things to the bottom and then pulling things off the bottom in this particular depiction of the stack. 
Remember that the text segment is where we store the actual components of the program, the instructions. So if we run a function, we add the return address to the stack, and the return address is going to be the details of some location stored in the text segment over there. So we'll have a, some very high address, some address that's at the top of our memory space, recording the location somewhere down below, the place that the execution will continue running from. We now have a few demos to illustrate all that we've learned about memory management so far and about how the size of programs change and where different things are located in a program's memory. As before, we will open up VS Code and our terminal and observe some of, the, some of this in action. I'll bring it over here. We have four demos starting with layout1.c and going up to layout4. So let's compile it. And let's take a look. Layout1.c is very simple. There's nothing much going on, just a main function and a return at the end. Let's look at how large this program is. We're going to use the size command, which is another program that comes built into most Unix-based operating systems, including Mac OS, if we're feeling happy today. Hmm? There we are. You can see what it's reported back to us is the size of different segments. In this case, the text segment is 16384 bytes. There is nothing in data because we haven't stored any variables and uh, these are some representations of it in other numeric systems. Let's go layout two. And open it up. We now have a static variable and a global variable. Let's see what this does to our size command. We are now storing information not just in the text segment, but in the data segment, indicated by our two static, vari our static variable and our global variable. Now, if we go back to our slide, which we should be able to do pretty quickly, these variables are not stack variables. They're variables that live outside of the actual function frame. So we have a few options of where to locate these. The OS kernel space is restricted, so we couldn't put it in there. That belongs to the operating system. The text is instructions to run, and we don't want to mix instructions with program variables, because then maybe someone might try and execute the variables, which sounds like a terrible idea. But we do have the BSS segment, the data segment, and the heap segment left over. We saw that the data segment was the one that our C compiler, that our size command was using to tell us where our variables were. And I think in this case, it's actually referring to both data and BSS. BSS is where we store our static variables. So we had the static variable in our layout two that's getting stored in data and uh, our, in BSS, and we have another variable that was stored in data. The difference between these two segments is that the data segments segment contains static variables or global variables that have already been initialized with a value at the start of the program, whereas the BSS segment contains only static variables that haven't yet been initialized and will later be filled with data once the program actually executes. We now have our static int initialized with a variable, with a particular value over here. So where are we gonna store it? Oh, it already says. We're storing it in the data segment because this time it is initialized. Previously, when it was uninitialized in the prior layout example, it would have been stored in the BSS segment because it wasn't set to anything. And now that it is set to something, we're going to store it in the data segment when we compile it. We have one more of these demos.
This time we have a global variable that's initialized and a static variable that's initialized. Both of them are going to end up in the data segment as opposed to in the BS segment. So now you know where all the different parts of the of a computer's mem memory are and where you might find the different elements of a program that you store, the different variables, the instructions, and other associated data. I want to recap for a minute our pointers from yesterday. This is admittedly one of the most challenging concepts in the course, so we're going to look at it one more time before moving on to uh, some demos of using pointers. Here we have our sample computer's memory layout again, going from address to 0x20, which is just hexadecimal, base 16, all the way up to 0x78. I can't show all of the computer's memory on the screen. That would be gigabytes and gigabytes worth. But here we see at least a little sample. Our pointer value, char a star, is located at memory address 060. That is where we, we're storing the pointer. Because a pointer is a variable like any other variable. The only special thing about it is inside that variable, we're going to store an address. So you can see if we look at address 0x60, if you read down the four bytes for a 32-bit address, we have 00000020. So we can see that at address 0x60, we have four bytes, and those four bytes read together store an address. We know it's an address because we've declared that A is a character pointer, char star A. Remember our magic star of dereferencing? That's what we use to declare something as a pointer and to dereference. If we want to figure out what's located at address 00000020, what we do is we apply our star of dereferencing to our variable A, and we instruct the computer to look at A, look at what's contained in it, and then dereference it. Remember, this was Henny's action from yesterday. We look at what's inside, we read it, and we go to the location referred to by it, our star of dereferencing. In this case, if we apply our star of dereferencing, also known as an asterisk, to the variable A, we look at address 20, we go up top, where is address 20? Over there, we read out the value 10, which in this case, we've said that it's a character pointer, so we look at just one byte. If it were an integer pointer, we would look at the four bytes subsequent, which are missing from the, from the diagram, but you could imagine there are more bytes in there. And because it's a character, we would interpret the 10 according to our ASCII conversion chart which lets us know for each particular value of uh, an integer value between 0 and 255, what number that, to what number that, to what letter that corresponds. As we saw yesterday, it can also get confusing very fast, especially once we start having pointers to pointers. This was Yara with the double star declaration out the front. This graphic here shows one such example of a pointer to a pointer. Before, we had just the single pointer starting at address 0x60, but now we have another pointer as well. This is the pointer starting at 0x00. Now, I know I'm ab abusing the uh, 0x00 here, because as we spoke about yesterday, we can't actually store anything at the address 0. It's just a graphic that maybe I'll update for that for next year, too. So looking at the first pointer starting at the very top of our memory over there, if we read it, 0000060. And if we dereference that, so we instruct the computer to look to read that address and go to the location pointed to by it, we then get to over here, 0x60. And if we follow that one, so if we use dereference again, this is two stars, one star to get from the first pointer to the second pointer, and another star to get from the second pointer to where it points. We follow this, we go to 0000020, and finally we get back to our 10. If you're having trouble understanding pointers, one useful thing you can do is draw out one of these diagrams, even if the addresses are made up. Uh, yes, Bernhard. Bernhard asks, if there are three, if you have a pointer to a pointer to a pointer, do you need three stars to get to the actual value? 
And that's totally correct. You can have pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers ad infinitum. The only problem is you're going to start getting lost very quickly where in the chain you are. There are many reasons why you might want to do this, particularly with double pointers, because we can use pointers to reference a set of objects that are located in a subsequent chunks of memory. But many times in mathematics and computer science, you'll want to have sets of sets. We mentioned in yesterday's lecture that a string is a set of characters. So if we want to have a set of strings, that would be a pointer pointing to a pointer. And then if we go to the next item in our larger set, in our pointer to a pointer, so we go one more along, then we'll get to the next string and so on and so forth. And we'll see this once we get to two-dimensional arrays in the next week and in um, when we get to more complex structures in subsequent weeks. Yes, do we have a question from Zoom? There's a question on Zoom chat. So all pointers are four bytes. All pointers are four bytes. All pointers are four bytes in this particular architecture that I'm representing on the screen. And what do I mean by an architecture? This is the design of the actual chip, the actual physical silicon chips inside the computer. The main chip, called the central processing unit, has an architecture that specifies the different things it can do and the ways in which you're allowed to feed input and output. Until probably about 10 or 15 years ago, most computers were 32 bits which meant that a pointer, 32 bits specified the maximum size of an address, and to represent an address that's 32 bits long, you need four bytes, each byte containing eight bits. Four times eight is 32. So using just four bytes, you could represent every possible address in a computer's memory. Now that we've moved to 64-bit computers largely, we now need eight bytes because eight by eight, 64, we again have enough bytes to represent the entire address space inside a computer. You'll note here that despite the fact that we more commonly use 64-bit machines now, even your phones are now 64-bit, it doesn't quite fit on screen, so we're gonna stick with 32-bit for our demos. And I think, I have a suspicion Grok might be 32-bit as well. That's right. Yep, that's correct, Grok is still 32-bit. Last week we learned that C was passed by value. What did this mean for when we wanted to pass a variable into a function? What was the function able to do and not able to do? Okay, well, we'll go with the answer from Zoom. What's the answer from Zoom? They might be able to unmute and say, give it a try. Try and unmute if you want. Um, wait, is yes, that me? You. Can you hear me? Is, is that Sarah? Sarah. Yeah, that's me. Um, I just said like a copy is made that is actually used by the function to be modified. And, and now, now I see Bunha has, has his hand, hand up, up as well. So, so we'll, we'll get, get an answer from him as well. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. And, and I'm, I'm glad, glad to see that we've uh, managed to get, to get some, some Zoom, Zoom people actually, actually coming, coming through. through. Uh, so for so the, the second, second question, question, so if we pass a function and address, address so, so um, if, if we de-reference that, like at the start, start then we, we can reveal the underlying integer, integer and then, and then or, or the number, number or something and then we can change, change that. that. Yeah, so let's put these two things together. Remember that when we, um, hold that for a second because otherwise it'll echo. When, remember that when we pass a variable to a function, it gets copied over. We get a photocopy of it and can't change the original. But as Bernhau said, if we copy an address, well, we still know the address and we can use that address to get to the actual thing. So the fact that we've made a photocopy of the address doesn't restrict us from changing what was at that original address. We'll maybe do a concrete example of that in a few minutes to illustrate how this is actually helpful. If you know where a variable is in memory, you can change it even if you've just received a photocopy. Now remember, the photocopy of a variable is not the same as a photocopy of that variable's address. This is why we're going to start using our ampersand operator to get the location of certain things in memory. Because if we give the location of something to a function, and say, say I'm in my main function here, and I'm in my subroutine here, my other function, and we'll call this function foo. Function main, 
uh, wants to allow function foo to modify the variable x. So in, if I were to just pass to foo, if I were to pa just pass to function foo x, then it would get a photocopy of it. Let's, let's use these as our, let's say that x contains a picture of a box of a mask. This is convenient because when it's passed to the foo function, that original box is still over there and the other function gets a photocopy. However, what happens if we apply our ampersand operator to the box? Instead of just getting a copy of the box, we get a copy of the address of the box. And imagine that this contains the address of the box and now we're photocopying the address of the box into foo. So the box is still over there, but now foo has a copy of its address. And if we combine these two things, if we've copied over the address, and now we apply our magic star of dereferencing to the address, Henny, ta-da! We can access our box, our original box again. The original box has not been photocopied, it was the box's address that was photocopied. And combining this with the dereferencing operator allows us to access the original box. And this is why we have both of these. In the prior, without understanding this conceptually, you might think, oh, I know how to make a pointer, I know how to dereference a pointer, why would I need to get the address of anything? You get the address of something if you want to use it inside a pointer, if you want to store it inside a pointer, so that you can photocopy it along and access it somewhere else, combining these two operations. If we don't have permission, to access the value copied over, what do we get? Someone up the back? Okay, Olivia. What happens if we access memory that we weren't allowed to using a pointer, what do we get? Starts with an S. Say louder. Segfault. Remember, this was our warning from the operating system that we're doing something that we are not allowed. We also saw at the end of, last, of, the end of yesterday's lecture that pointers can be null. They can be set to zero, and this is a warning that the pointer, does, the pointer no longer points to anything that's usable or allowable. And what happens if we dereference a null pointer? What do we get, everyone? Segfault. So the star symbol can be used in a few ways. It's used both to indicate that the variable we are going to, that we're declaring, is a pointer. It's also used to dereference things, and it's also used to multiply two numbers together. So as our wonderful Admiral Akbar reminds us, it's a trap. Unfortunately, you're going to have to learn the different context in which the asterisk is used for each of these different purposes. If, it's, if the asterisk comes after the name of a type in a variable declaration where you're saying that you're creating a variable, then it's being used to tell the, comp tell the compiler that the variable is of a pointer type. If you're using it without that type but in front of a variable name, it's going to be used as a dereferencing operator and then if you use it between two variables, it's going to be used as a multiplication operator. So let's type that out in, th in the terminal. So, that's so as a indicator of a type, if I have my type name and then add an asterisk and then put the name of the variable, this is use number one. Use number two. So here the asterisk is in front of the variable name, but it's not preceded by a type declaration. So that's the magic star of dereferencing. And number three, if I'm just trying to multiply two numbers together, I put the asterisk between them. And remember that C is white space insensitive. So despite the fact that there is no space between the star and the D, this is still a multiplication operator because the thing that comes before the star is another variable. Be careful of that particular trap. And now we have another series of demos to help you become a little more confident with how pointers are actually used in the C programming language.
Here is our first pointer demo. We have a static declaration of a variable w. Where is this one gonna be stored? We've just talked about this. Is this gonna be stored in the data segment or in the BSS segment? BSS. BSS, and why is it being stored in the BSS segment? Yeah, it hasn't been assigned any value yet, and because it's a static variable, it can't be stored on the stack, it's just gonna be stored in the BSS segment. We then create three variables, just normal variables, and we're going to print the address of each of these variables. We're using the ampersand, which takes a variable and produces, the ad produces its address. In our format specifier, when we're doing our print statement, You'll notice that we are now using the p format string specifier. The p tells the compiler that the thing we want to print is a pointer, and we are going to leave plenty of room for it. And then add new lines in between. Let's see what happens. What did I do here? Can anyone see? Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Uh, it prints out the addresses of all our variables. You can see that at the low address, in the BSS segment, we have our variable w, and the other three variables are at a fairly high address because they're in the stack. They are stack variables because they are declared and allocated, we've assigned the memory for them, inside the main function, which is placed on the stack. Pointer demo two. We're getting a little more sophisticated now. We're using a fancier syntax to declare some of our variables. C allows for this flexibility of declaring both a non-pointer type and a pointer type within the same line of C code. Now, this is not my personal preference for style, but it is acceptable to do. You'll see here we have declared a variable n and assigned it a value and separated with a comma another variable declaration. And if I wanted to do this without considering pointers, I could do it as such. I could do int y, z equals five, like that, and that's a perfectly valid C statement. But back to our, what we've actually written in the program, I have a variable n to which I've assigned the value one, two, three, and an integer pointer that I've called pi. On the next line, I have a double value. Remember, this is one of the types for floating point numbers, for numbers that have a decimal point, um, but it is doubly as precise as an ordinary float. So we've created a double set to 456.789, 456.789, and created a pointer to a double. We're going to print our value n, we're going to print our value x, and then we will print the address, oh, then we will set our two pointers to the address of both of these variables. Now, just like in the previous example, the ampersand operator, the address operator, allows us to get one of these values to store inside a pointer for later use. So in this case, we're storing the address of n inside pi, and we're storing, or pi, and we're storing the address of x inside pd, and then we print them out. This is where we finally use our magic dereference operator, our magic star of dereferencing. And before I run, all of the, run this code, I want you to speak to someone sitting next to you, or if there's no one sitting quite next to you, uh, write down on a sheet of paper what you think the results of these two computations are going to be. PI equals star PI plus one, and star PD equals star PD on star PI. Yash, do you want to unmute on Zoom and give us your opinion about what's going to happen? 
Um, so basically, they'll get de addressed. Um, so yes, you'll have to speak up quite loudly because you're not coming through so strong in the audience. Is this better? Yeah, that's um, better. <clears throat> so, uh, so star pi gets the address to n, so it will be n equals n plus one, I think, and then star pd will get the address to uh, x, so it will be um, x is x over uh, uh, n. Yeah. So Yasha's prediction is that the value of n will be n plus one, and the value of, uh, of x will be x on n. Let's see if this plays out. Initially, we have, let me make this bigger. Initially, we have n equals one, two, three, and x equals four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then after assigning pi and pd to the address of n and the address of x, we see that when, if we dereference them, they contain the same values. But remember, these aren't photocopies. We haven't photocopied these values. What we've done is put the addresses of n and x inside pi and pd. So, Yash was correct. When we dereference pi and add one to it, and store that inside pi, which we're doing using our dereferencing star again, then the actual value of x changes. You can see this in our, uh, the actual value of n changes. You can see this over here. If we dereference pi and store and add one to it and store the result in the place that pi points to, not only does the thing that pi is pointing to change, but the original thing changes because they are one and the same. What pi points to is n, and so n itself changes. Likewise with pd. And you can see that we've divided that uh, 456 by 789 by 124 in there. Next demo, pointer 3.c. Oh, no balloons. I brought balloons yesterday for this and forgot them today, so we might have to do this demo um, with people. Okay, I need three volunteers. Okay. Guys at the front I've seen too much of. how you haven't been around the front. Rosa, do you want to come down? And Kyle, you up for it? Oh, sorry, Douglas, I got you two confused. And we need our floor microphones. We'll go over here and we'll use our floor microphones. And come on, Rosa, run down. It's off. OK, we'll turn that on. And maybe stand over here so that you can see what's going on on the screen as well. Douglas, if you want to take that to start. And three of you line up. We're going to have x, y, and z. Um, and each of you look at the first line of code over there and tell us what your name is in terms of uh, the, your variable name and what value you contain. Hello, I'm X, and uh, it looks like I contain two. Very good. You're playing into it, but how? Okay, so I'm Y, and I'm three. Okay. Uh, I'm Z, and I'm four. Okay. Now we're going to need three more people. And so I want three more volunteers for our variables. What was your name? Manul. Manul? Come up. Whoever's, whoever's being pointed to back there, who I can't see. Online people are volunteers. No, nope, online people. I would love to have all of you online people. And I need two, two more people. D, you want to come down? No. Come on. Need two more folks. Okay. 
Okay, Olivia, you're up. And Kevin. Make it quick. Our function here uses three more variables. So these are going to be our, sorry, Manal, just stand a little bit away from everyone. Liam, you're gonna need to rotate the camera a bit so this works. Um, so we have our three variables, x, y, z. This here is our main function. Over here in this corner, you're really gonna have to rotate it. No, they're gonna be over here. They can see? Okay. And this here is going to be our int swap function. Thank you very much. And we will make you three in order. So stand, stand in a line so that we can, so that the audience can see it. We'll do it, yeah, this way will probably work. So we'll have temp, p1, and p2. And we need our second, oh, we'll use that microphone. Great, okay, let's go back to the start of our function and run this through just with people. So printf, we've done our first printf. We have our three variables that have spat out their names. Now we do int swap, address of x, and address of y. So our two arguments are p1 and p2, who are over here. And so what do you do? If you're the address of something, remember from last lecture, you are pointers. So each of you point to the variable whose address you've just received. So you've received your addresses from the fine folks over here. We've just put x and y into here. Yeah. So maybe switch order, switch you two. So we've got p1, p2, and temp. Okay, pointing to x, pointing to y. And we have our temp variable. Okay, temp is currently empty. The first thing that temp does is dereferences pointer one. So take the star of dereferencing. Cool. Who's P1? That's Kevin, right? And what's Kevin pointing to? Use your dereferencing. And it's pointing to X. And the value of X was, we'll scroll up and see what the value of X was. It was two. Yeah. So Manal now has the value of two because he's followed the pointer along and has made a copy of Douglas, which is two. Right, so now, where's the, where's the microphone gone? One of you still has it? There we go. Yeah. Say your name and your variable name and what you contain. Okay, cool. So my name is Manu. My variable name is X and I contain, oh, my variable name is temp and I contain two. Yeah, and it, remember he contains two not because two was passed into the function, but because a pointer to two was passed into the function and Manal used the dereferencing star to access the original value. Now, pointer one takes the dereferencing star, and what happens if we use the dereferencing star for pointer one? Where do you go? Go to pointer two, and which is point to variable y. So pointer two on this side is pointing to variable y. So if we use, if we dereference it, who do we get? Which of these three people? We get Bung Hao in the middle, whose value was? You've got the microphone? Three. Yeah. So we've used, oh, we've done a dereference over here, and we get the value of three, and we store the value of three in? Pointer P1 and pointer one. So we've taken the value three from, take the value three from Bunhao and give it to Douglas. You can do that. You can just go over in motion and take the value three, use your, act it out. Yep, exactly. <laughs> we, we take the value from Bunhao and we give it to Douglas and now give the microphone to Douglas. Douglas, what number do you contain? What's your variable name? Hello, I, I, I'm X, I, I think, and I am now three, I think. Exactly, so what we've done using our pointers is we've taken the value that was inside the thing pointed to by pointer one, by pointer two, and put it inside of pointer one. So using this construction has allowed us to copy a value that was in one location into another location. We have one last statement in our swap function, and Olivia, this is where you come in. 
Um, so pointer to, where are you pointing to currently? If we look at our in swap here, the second argument pointed to received the address of y. And so that was Bunhao over here was y, and so we're still pointing at him. And you're going to store something new at him. Because remember, our dereference means go to that address and do something. And what we're going to do is we're going to store in the value of temp. And temp was mana. So you don't, you don't pass over the star. What you do is you're going to copy over whatever Manal is storing, which was two. two. Remember, it was two because we took that in our first line over here. We copied into Manal our two from pointer one. So we have the value two. And Olivia is going to go and put the value two with the star of dereferencing inside uh, Bunhao. And Rosa, I'm afraid we're not going to get to you in this one because z is just an unused variable in that prior in swap. It is not reflected at all in this one. Uh, can we have a round of applause for our volunteers? Thank you very much. And Olivia, if you want to give the microphone back to Liam, and I'll take the magic star. And these will be available for sale at uh, $3 each. So we will do a few more pointer demos tomorrow and then move on to arrays. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you've also enjoyed today. That was fairly interactive. And Rosa, I'll actually catch you for something next time where, you, where you're needed. And yeah, I'll see you all later. <laughs>